It's a real pleasure for me to welcome you to the keynote and awards ceremony of the 2011 FAU Business Plan Competition. On behalf of the College of Business and the Adams Center for Entrepreneurship, and of course our pre presenting sponsor, SBA Communications, we thank you for celebrating our 16 finalists today. We have a terrific program for you. Entrepreneurs transform the world every day, from new innovation pizza franchises to the creation of medical devices that save lives. Almost every large company traces their beginning to an entrepreneur. Thomas Edison, GE, Bill Gates, Microsoft, Phil Knight, Nike, Sam Walton of Walmart, Steve Jobs of Apple, and the list goes on and on. I'm hoping our 16 finalists are about to make history right here at FAU. FAU's 2011 business plan competition was created on the premise that the South Florida economy thrives on small businesses. Therefore, we wanted to create a program to foster the development of these small business ideas. The competition gives participants a chance to test their business ideas, receive valuable advice, and of course mentorship on launching a new business. Our volunteers of experienced venture capital leaders, early stage investors, successful entrepreneurs, and senior business leaders groom the 16 finalists to compete for more than $125,000 in cash and prizes today. The ACE mission is to create entrepreneurial leaders that find sustainable solutions to economic and social problems. We're proud to have the Adams Center for Entrepreneurship here at FAU as it is a tremendous resource to our students and our FAU community. ACE, in affiliation with management programs, strives to teach entrepreneurship. Over the past year, there were 493 undergraduate students enrolled in entrepreneurship classes, 35 in our entrepreneur boot camp, and today we have members of our executive forum series class here participating. Over 165 teams registered for this year's competition, up from 121 last year and 64 in 2009. Evidence that the South Florida business supports local entrepreneurs is reflected in year-over-year -year increase of the total prize value during a difficult economic time. In 2009, we raised $33,000. In 2010, it was $75,000, and this year, 125000 Here's the, here's the kicker. My goal is to increase the purse over time to $1 million so the world knows that South Florida is serious about business. Next year, we hope to add a high, a high school track to the competition. <laughs> you may have noticed our young entrepreneurs from Spanish River High School. If you're in the room, please raise your hand. Thank you for being my volunteers today. And they are here from the DECA program at Spanish River High, and they're learning about entrepreneurship, and we're hoping next year that they're going to be competing right alongside the adults. <clears throat> there are 63 volunteers, 20 sponsors, and hundreds of hours of staff time who have made today possible. I'd like to personally thank each of them and recognize their dedication to entrepreneurship. So please join me in a round of applause. Today, we have a very special program in store for you. I'm very excited about the outcome of the competition in our keynote. I'd like to invite Javier Perez to tell his story as an FAU MBA student and an AT&T associate. Javier, if you would please join me at the front. Thank you very much, Kimberly, for the opportunity. <laughs> Today is a very special day for many people. For those competing in the competition that have worked hard on a plan to make their dreams a reality. For everybody that graciously donated their time and money to make this event happen. For the FAU family and for America in general. Today, the hopes of a new company will start tomorrow investments in these companies and then what everybody's been talking about new jobs are created so big thank you to all of you for helping to keep the America dream alive you, 
I am here today is to introduce our keynote speaker for the day, Mr. Ralph De La Vega. But before I do so, I would like to thank Kimberly Graham and Dr. Golden, Brown, Golden that I don't see, there she is, for the executive uh, forum class that they lead. Th that class expanded my, my mind in many ways, and in that class, I was able to meet and ask questions to captains of industry. It is amazing the amount of knowledge that I gained just by listening to these uh, entrepreneurs, CEOs, and executive leaders. This class was the reason why I, I reached out to Mr. De La Vega, and I was thrilled to get an answer from him saying, Javier, I would love to be in your university. Please contact Julie to see if we can make it happen. I'm like, wow, I'm first level manager, you know? <laughs> so that tells you the type of person that he is. So I approached Kimberly Graham the same day that Jeff Stoop was presenting uh, CEO of SBA Communication, and we were all excited about the opportunity of having such an outstanding leader here today. In addition with the things that I share, I can't emphasize enough what Mr. De La Vega visit means to me today. His story has inspired thousands of people. To me personally, his story hits close to home. He's a native from Cuba that migrated to the United States after the Cuban Revolution. An American welcomed him with open arms and gave, the, gave him the tools to be successful. He knew how to use them, and he's a great leader today. He started his career in Southern Bell as a facility engineer in the plantation office. After graduating in 1974 from this university, from FAU, with a bachelor's in science in mechanical engineering. In the year of 1985, 90, he moved to and he was there the director and division manager for Bell Corps. Belcor Tech, and through those years he earned his MBA degree from the Northern Illinois University. In 1992, probably because of weather, he came back to Florida. <laughs> he came back to Florida, and if you remember 1992 was the year the Hurricane Andrew hit. He was the operations managers, operation manager for North Dade County, and he had to rebuild the devastation caused by that hurricane. Between 1994 and 1996, he was the Vice President of Consumer Service for the state of Florida, and uh, he completed the Darden Executive Program from the University of Virginia. In 2000, he was the President of Broadband and Internet Service, the new division that revolutionized the way our company did business. We went from interconnecting people over the phone to connecting each person to the entire world. In 2002, he was Bell South Latin America president, and he spun that division from the red into a profitable one, despite the severe economic depression and political unrest in the region, the same ones that forced me to migrate. In 2004, he was chief operating officer for Singular Wireless, and in that role he had a big responsibility and was integration of two of the biggest wireless networks, those of AT&T and uh, Singular Wireless, and he created the biggest wireless network out there today. In 2007, he revolutionized again the way we connect to the world when he was CEO of AT&T Mobility. How? He brought the world into our pockets. Such an outstanding leader can only get complimented with the type of person he is. He, he of course, has a busy schedule, but he always finds time to give back to the community. And that's, what I see, that's how, why I see him as a role model. He has the same belief that I have and is in education. He believes that educating young children can help break the poverty pattern most of them go under. So he encouraged people to donate money if they can, but more importantly, donate time. Donate time to people. That, and that's, that will be very rewarding at the, uh, through your careers and start doing it now rather than later. So let's start giving back. He's also the author of the book Obstacles Welcome, Turn Adversity into Advantage in Business and Life, a must-read book for all of you that really want to create an impact and help the community. So without further ado, please welcome Mr. Ralph De La Vega. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. we do a quick sound check, and you guys uh, hear me okay in the back? They turn the mic on. We're good? Okay. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Good. You know, it's really, uh, it's really a pleasure to be back at FAU, but before I get into my comments, I want to thank 
President Saunders, who's here today. Fantastic new president. I'm so thrilled about the future of this institution, knowing that you're here. So uh, thank you for being here and what you're doing for this great university. And then Dean Stevens uh, gave me a great tour this morning of what a beautiful new green building means, and uh, very, very impressed. Dean Coates uh, told me that he's got one of the largest business schools uh, in the nation, right here at FAU, how many things change. And, and I want to thank uh, Randy Talbot, of course, the one and only Kimberly Graham. I only met her yesterday, but I know she's the one and only. <laughs> but I received uh, a tremendously uh, warm, warm homecoming. And, and quite frankly, I'm surprised. I, I was surprised that you invited me back after I burned the carpet in the dorm when I was here. <laughs> Believe it or not, my roommate decided to fry bananas or plantains in the dorm and he burned the carpet. But I paid it back, you billed me, and I paid every penny of it back. <laughs> but you know, to, to me what is, um, what is interesting is as I look back at my time at FAU, uh, FAU to me changed my life because what I wanted to be was an engineer since I was a child, I had in my mind that I wanted to be an engineer. And FAU, as you were going to hear, gave me that chance. But I came really close, really close to not making it. And so what I wanted to do today is tell you a little bit about my personal story. You know, why would anybody write on a book called Obstacles Welcome? That's not what you typically want. Uh, but I, I like to talk briefly about my personal story and how I almost did not become an engineer in hopes that it could help some of you in the audience overcome the obstacles you face. Talk a, a little bit about the framework that I've used to be successful domestically and internationally. Uh, and then finally talk about what you've been talking about all day, about entrepreneurship, about innovation, and what we're doing at AT&T, a very big company, to act like a real small company and be innovative and creative. So that's the agenda. Now, I want to take you back to my early childhood and explain to you why I almost didn't become an engineer. Uh, and it began with this picture, if I think I can get the first picture here. This is a picture uh, of my family. Uh, that's my mom holding my sister. Uh, that's my dad in the background, and that's me uh, eating an ice cream cone. This is my sister's most unfavorite picture. <laughs> she has no hair. <laughs> she doesn't like this picture, but she's a beautiful young lady today with two beautiful uh, a baby boy and a baby girl. But this is life in Cuba in the late 1950s before the Cuban Revolution. We were a middle class family. We were doing well. My dad was running a food distribution business. And then when the Cuban Revolution came, it turned our lives upside down. You know, the, uh, the freedoms that we had known uh, became fewer and fewer. We began to fear for our safety. Uh, you could be jailed for the least infraction. And my family's business was nationalized, the food distribution was taken over by the government. And so my dad was essentially out of business. Uh, in Cuba, food distribution was done by the government. So it's not like you could go to Publix and buy anything you wanted to. No, it's what the government had to sell that day. And so my family's business was gone. And so the family made the difficult decision to leave the country. Now, when you got ready to leave the country in Cuba, you had to leave everything behind to the government. You couldn't pass on anything to your family, so your home to the government, your savings account to the government, your car to the government, all your material possessions to the government. You could essentially leave with the clothes on your back. And it tells you something about the country we are that my family was willing to give everything up to give my sister and I a future as Americans in this country. That says a lot about what this country means to people from outside that sometimes we don't appreciate. You're willing to give up everything you own your language, your culture, all your material savings to give those two little kids up there a chance to live in freedom and liberty. So we thought that was a difficult decision to give up everything. But when we got to the airport, our family had to make probably the most difficult decision any family had to make. Because when they looked at our papers, the militiaman behind the counter said five words that changed my life and my family's life forever. And the five words were, only the boy can go. Only the boy can go. So my dad started making calls. 
will somebody take this boy? <laughs> Thank God that they did. Uh, he made some calls to friends of the family in Miami, and he said, would you mind watching over Ralph for a few days? This can't possibly take more than a few days to get our papers straight. And they decided to send me ahead. They told me, my dad said, it's going to be like a sleepover, Ralph. Don't worry. That will be the last time I will see my parents for four years. So I'm in a foreign country with a new family, new language, new culture. And I tell people, I didn't even like the food. Because <laughs> when I got here, the first food that I was given was by the lady next door, a nice American lady. And she immediately brought me uh, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a cold glass of milk. Hey, we don't drink cold uh, milk in Cuba. It was always warm with chocolate and a lot of sugar. And we didn't have peanut butter jelly sandwich. We had Cuban sandwiches. I was a little bit spoiled, so I refused to eat it. But the family that took me in were very poor. They were immigrants, and there was nothing else to eat. So that's, that was what was for lunch, and that was what was for dinner. And by the time dinner got around, I, I bit into that peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and the rest is history. I like milk, but I still don't like peanut butter. And so that really started me on the path. And, you know, in those early days, things were so difficult that we got food and that was handed to us by the government as part of the Cuban refugee program. They gave us cans of Spam and cheddar cheese. And the cans of Spam were like a paint can of Spam, generic Spam and cheese. And that's what we had to eat because the family that took me in had gotten here five months before I did. So they didn't speak the language. They didn't have any money. And we were living on just until they could get a job. But the American entrepreneurship system went to work. And just like millions of other immigrants, that family that took me in worked at a factory building furniture. Then they set up their own little factory. Then they built the showroom. And it, you know, the story goes on. They developed their own business, just like you're trying to teach these young people to do. It was the American dream. Finally, my parents came four years later, and now I'm in high school, and I have to start all over again because, you know, the family that took me in, they had progressed. They had begun to build the business. They were making money. Now I'll go back to my parents. It's back to ground zero again. So it's great that the family's here, but now I'm finding, again, no financial resources and, you know, nowhere to go. So I went to, uh, to see my high school counselor and told him that I wanted to be an engineer. And he looked at my grades. My grades were average. I was just learning how to speak English. And he looked at my family's finances. We had none. And he said, son, uh, you should be a mechanic. You should be a mechanic. And I said, OK, I'll be a mechanic. So I stopped going to regular high school classes and started going to George T. Baker Aviation School in Miami, Florida to learn how to be an airframe mechanic for airplanes until my grandmother came from Cuba. My abuela. Abuela was a, a teacher in Cuba, raised seven sons and daughters, and uh, was a great cook. <clears throat> but she uh, talked to me and she said, Ralph, this, what you're doing doesn't make any sense. You tell me that you want to be an engineer, but you're studying to be a mechanic. It makes no sense. Then she said something that I've always repeated when I talk to young people, and she said, don't let anybody ever put limitations on what you can achieve. If you want to be an engineer, you can be an engineer. So I did a control alt delete on that counselor's advice, <laughs> came to FAU and became an engineer. And that's the background story of you know, my scenario of how I, I came to where I am. People always ask me, by the way, this is, uh, I forgot to show you the picture. This is a picture right here uh, uh, about that time when my grandmother came. And uh, I remember that, was, uh, that shirt that I had there was about the only shirt that I had. <laughs> we, were, uh, we were not of uh, good means. In fact, when, when I graduated from FAU, I was driving a beat up Volkswagen. And uh, my windshield wipers broke down about the last week that I was about to graduate. The windshield wiper motor on the Volkswagen broke. And I didn't have the money to fix it. So I prayed that there wasn't going to be any rain <laughs> that week. <laughs> But it worked out, and then I got a job, and the rest is history. So I started with very, very uh, humble beginnings. Uh, but people often ask me, you know, how did I get to where I am? And the first thing I tell them is, it has to be a great country that allows a 10-year-old kid 
to come to his shores without his family, without knowing the language, uh, without knowing the culture, without any money. I brought no money whatsoever. And I'm sitting here talking to you as the chief executive officer for AT&T Mobility, a company that has 95 million customers and 50 billion in revenues. It has to be a great country, isn't it? I, I often get asked, well, how, how did you do this? And I, over the years, I've come up with a, a little framework that I wanted to share with you. I'll go over that. We'll talk about innovation, and we'll have plenty of time for, uh, for Q&A. But uh, I, I, I tell the story using this, uh, this framework. And if you look at the framework, it looks like a, a house with a roof and a foundation. And beginning at the, at the very beginning, at the top, I tell people that to follow your dreams and to dream big. Now, Kimberly has no problem dreaming big, right? <laughs> this is the perfect example right here. 125,000 today, but a million. <laughs> That's exactly what I try to preach to. Most oftentimes, people limit themselves, or they let others put limitations on what you can achieve. So I tell people, go big, dream big, and go, f go for it. Don't let anybody have you settle for less. And you've got to believe in yourself. And she is the perfect example. I didn't even realize what you were going to say, but that's the perfect case. So we're doing 125 this year, I'm going to get a million the next whatever. That's, that's what it begins with. But if that's all you have, all you have is a dream and an idea. And that is not enough. I don't care how much you want to dream and push for it, you've got to have what's underneath those four pillars. And I tell people you've got to develop a winning plan. Okay, if you're going to get to a million, what do you need to do? And I know you've already thought about that. But you, people often, uh, when I talk to them, have a great dream, but there's nothing underneath it. And, and that doesn't work in business. It doesn't work anywhere. So I tell people, you have to have a plan that allows you to get there and know whether you're on track or not in order to reach your goal. Sometimes people also don't want to pay the price of what it takes to get from point A to point B. I see them wanting to get to point B, but they don't want to go through the hassle of going from point A to point B. And uh, I've always felt like I paid the price. I started at the lowest ranks in management, and I worked my way up. Uh, I didn't get uh, a free ride. I earned everything I got. And if you plan that way, you're most likely to get there. But that, even that's not enough. So if you have a big dream and you have a good plan, that's not enough. You're going to have to learn how to take a risk, not a, not a crazy risk that but calculated risk that push you beyond your comfort zone. I've always found that I did my best when I was pressed, when I was put in a situation where you needed to come up with new ideas, new approaches, and it made me the best leader I could be. You know, Dean Coates and I were talking about this today in academia. You guys are going through a budgeting process where you're having to reduce budgets. And guess what? Everybody else is having to do the same thing. But we should not let ourselves be a victim of that. I could have, at any point in time in my life, have said, if only my parents had been here. If only I had spoken English and I could compete with the guys in the classroom or the people. You could have all kinds of reasons, but being a victim is not anything that you should put any focus on. So I tell people, take a risk, go out there on the leading edge, and be the best you can be. When I took the job in Latin America that Javier was talking about, let me give you the scenario so you understand why I did it and why it was a risk. The division that I took over, first of all, he was right, had never made money in its history. And then they put me there at a time when Latin America was in trouble. In Argentina, the peso, which was pegged one to one to the dollar, was devalued four to one. So the billion dollar company that I ran in Argentina went from a billion to 250 US dollars overnight. Let me tell you, that hurts a business plan. <laughs> that hurts a business plan for that year big time. So then you go to the next uh, country that was the most profitable country we had, Venezuela. In Venezuela, Hugo Chavez has a coup attempt at that time. He is run out of office for a day and a half. They put the president of the Chamber of Commerce to head the country. He abolishes the Supreme Court, the Constitution, and the next day they bring Chavez back. <laughs> then the businesses go on strike and mail is, uh, is stopped. The banks are closed, the shopping centers are closed. There's chaos in Venezuela the second most profitable country. I go to Brazil. In Brazil, we had formed a joint venture with another Brazilian partner. The Brazilian partner fails to put up a $475 million payment that was coming due. And we default on a billion dollar loan 
that was not recourse to Bell South at the time, but we had to deal with 34 different Brazilian banks to renegotiate. And then in Colombia, the FARC rebels, there was a group of rebels who were blowing up our radio towers. And other than that, it was business as usual. <laughs> so they offered me the job, and the guy that I am, I took it. <laughs> Do you want this job? And my friends called me and said, Ralph, I thought that you had done well. Why did they do this to punish you? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? I said, there's all kinds of problems over there. And I go, no, no, there's all kinds of opportunities over there. Think of what we could do. Well, what we did is we turned that company around to the black in the first year. And by the third year, the company was more profitable after the Depression than before the Depression. And so I tell people, our business was so bad in Latin America before I got there that they actually took our division off the annual report. <laughs> you know your division is not doing well when all of a sudden it's not in the annual report. So our challenge was, let's get back on the annual report, let's turn it positive, and we did. We became the pocket of growth that the company had in Latin America as opposed to a problem in Latin America. Uh, but that, that's the key about taking, overcoming obstacles. I think we were talking with the dean. As soon as you put a plan in place in almost any business today, you're going to have an obstacle that gets in your way that forces you to rejig the plan to change it. And if you view obstacles as something that gets you off your game and distracts you, then you're going to be in trouble because you're going to face obstacles all the time. And I tell people, you just got to get over it and deal with it as, okay, here's an obstacle. It's going to get me something. That something is recognizing opportunities. What I have found most often in business is people only see problems. They f seldom see the opportunities. And the reason for that is most opportunities are disguised as problems. I would say that without problems, they're not opportunities. But when you look at stuff, you go, like Latin America, oh man, I got so many problems over there. Well, it's a lot of opportunity if you can fix those problems. So that is the framework that I have used. I've taken risks. I've had plans to execute. But the biggest thing that I wanted to leave with you is, you see that house, what it's sitting on? On a foundation. And those are called the principles of what everything else is based on. So I want to talk a little bit about the principles of how I run my life and my business because the principles are really a key. Uh, and I want to not talk to them about this, uh, but it's showing to you in a, in a pyramid form. But the house analogy is, if you look at the first principles uh, up here, look at the one on integrity because that's what I'm going to talk about first. And I tell people that if you don't have integrity, you cannot be a good leader. And even the smallest crack in your integrity creates a crack in the foundation of that house and the house will fall apart without you having the utmost integrity. So I can tell you that in my career, this is what I have used. And I, I've done it from experience. I like to tell you a little bit about it, why I'm so strong on integrity. The first day and the first week that I left FAU to take a job with Southern Bell at the time, I was a facility engineer like Javier mentioned. But when you were an engineer at the time, they also gave you another job to do as a management person. And my job was to check coin telephone stations. You may, some of you may not know what that is. <laughs> and that's OK. That means you're really young. But they, they used to have these coin stations where you would put a coin and you could make a call, right? And we had lots of them. It was a huge business for us at the time when I, when I graduated. Now it's all wireless phones. But then we had to go and check to make sure they were working that they had a Yellow Pages book, and so you had to put a coin in and, and make a test call. Well, I'm still driving that beat up Volkswagen with a windshield wiper problem, and I'm, I'm, my first week on the job, they give me the station to check. I go in and check, I put my quarter in, and it's like I hit the three bananas in Las Vegas. Money starts coming out. <laughs> what a great job. <laughs> what a job. This is a great country. <laughs> And you know, I didn't know what to do with I mean, coins just came out. So I took every one of those coins, and I returned it to my district manager and said, you told me to check this thing. I don't know what happened, but I know I'm not supposed to have this money, so I'm giving it back to you. Went back and do my engineering work. He comes back in two hours in Plantation, Florida, and he says, son, did you know those coins were marked? I go, what are you talking about? Oh, yeah, those coins were marked. They were set up there for the coin collectors that are supposed to collect those coins to make sure they didn't pocket any of those coins. So you just happen to walk into it. And I go, wow. He said, if you'd taken those coins, I'd have to fire you. 
first week on the job. Integrity, you know, whether somebody's watching it or not, you, I tell people I don't want anybody on my team that uh, doesn't have the highest of integrity because it just doesn't pay. And so I tell people when I look for people to bring in my organization, that's the number one thing. If you don't have integrity, I don't care how smart you are. I don't care about the pedigree you've got. I don't care how good you look or how you behave. If you don't have integrity, utmost integrity, I just don't want you on my team. And when you run an international operation like I did in, in Latin America, that is so important. Because any small infraction in Latin America can, can get you into a violation of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And the company that I inherited in Latin America had already done that twice. So in addition to everything I said, there had been small misgivings, but misgivings so that one more strike and we would be in real, real trouble. I actually interviewed every person that reported to one of our CEOs in those companies personally, in English and in Spanish, telling them, this is the way we do business in Latin America. We do business in Latin America like we do business in the States. We're a U.S.-based company, and you have to abide by the U.S.-based rules. I don't care what the customs are. And one of the things that we found out in Latin America it was that we were giving generals free phone service. You can't do that. That's a violation of the FCPA. So I told our team, you give the generals two choices. They can pay for the service, so they can return the service back to us, you know, disconnected. My team went as quiet as you guys are right now. And they, <laughs> their next words were, Ralph, do we have to? <laughs> and I said, yes. Because, you know, when us I found out, we, so we went back to every general, and we got either to pay for it or to, uh, or to give us the service back. And actually, one of our managers, after that happened, got, uh, got arrested. Uh, but we got him out. <laughs> but it proved the point that we were serious about not violating practices. After that, I actually met with most of the presidents in those countries and told them this basic message. Bell South is the largest, at the time, the largest investor in Latin America of any U.S. corporation. We'll invest in your country if you help me promote the rules that I have to abide by. If you don't, then we will leave the country because we can't operate in any other way. We improved our margins. We had record profits. We didn't participate in any of that. And uh, I'm proud to tell you that after we did it, our team felt so relieved to know that they had a, a beacon that at least they were guided by, that they didn't have to succumb to some of the things that they were seeing our competitors do. So big believer in, in integrity. Credibility to me means do you do what you said you're going to do? And if, if you don't do what you said you're going to do, I don't want you on my team. You don't want anybody that tells you they're going to do this and then they don't do it. So those to me are the principles, the leadership characteristics that I look for. Attitude. I've never seen anything more powerful than a, than a positive attitude. It's contagious. You know, you can see it. People just love a positive attitude. When you have a good attitude with good talent, the walls come crumbling down on things that people thought they could not do. I tell people that my, my one criteria of how you know you are doing the best job as a leader is when you can convince people that they can do things that they thought were impossible to do. Now, if you have done that with any large group of people, then you know that that is, to me, the optimal thing any leader can do. When the people say, I don't think we can do this, and you say, no, we can. Let's, let, and you outline the plan, and you do the things that I talked about. That To me, that's the, the top of any leader. Uh, teamwork, I tell folks, uh, at least in my business, in my industry, it's not an individual sport. It's a team sport. And you have to learn how to work in teams. That's why I was so pleased, uh, Dean Coates, that I saw this, this, this demo today of, of the presentation of the plans. There was a lot of kids that were sweating there today, but that's the real world environment where you have to make a presentation to a board or to a committee of the board, at least in my company. And you, know, you get those kind of questions and you have to be able to answer them with, with, uh, you know, with good composure. And being part of a team is, is a huge enabler for that. Uh, excellence, I tell people excellence because we have to find new ways to run our company every day of the week, every year. If we were running our company today like we did a year ago, I think we would have been in trouble. And if we were running it like it were two years ago, we may be out of business. Our industry is changing so fast that if we don't change fast and look for a better way, more excellence, uh, we're, we're really going to be in trouble. And finally, vision. I tell people it's not just having a vision or understanding the company's vision, but being able to convince others 
to follow the vision. Convincing. So those are the things uh, that I have lived by, and I hope that they've been helpful to some extent. Uh, let me, uh, let me uh, switch now and talk a little bit about entrepreneurship, innovation, and what we're doing at AT&T. AT&T is a $120 billion company in revenues yearly. We're a big, big company. Our mobility part of that is about half of that, or about $60 billion. Uh, the P&L that I run is $60 billion, and it's been running between 8 to 9% per year growth. You can do the math that to, to run a $60 billion business running at close to 10% revenue growth, you've got to be bringing in big, big revenue streams. It can't be a million. It's got to be a B behind it to make a difference, <laughs> right? And so my biggest fear is that we're so big that we were missing small opportunities that may look small today, but in five to 10 years, it could be big. And so what we did is uh, we set up a division uh, that's called the Emerging Devices Division inside of my organization at AT&T. And we allowed them to operate on a different set of rules. Uh, and their whole objective was to entice et entrepreneurs, just like the ones that we were seeing present, to be able to come to AT&T, not as big AT&T, but as a small company that has its own legal support, its own laboratories, its own finance department, and its own way to develop pricing models that would be able to take an entrepreneur and help them bring their product to market by helping their product connect to our network. These are typically products that have network connectivity requirements in order for them to work. And so we, over the last five quarters, have been adding about a million connected devices to our network uh, over, over the last, every quarter for the last five quarters. We actually have some of our competitors that so far have reported zero just to give you an idea for how far we are, that some of the other competitors, I've, they, they have not even begun to figure this out. And what you have to do is you have to run as a different company, small inside of a big company. So today, we power all the Amazon Kindle books. They're powered by our network. If you have a Barnes & Noble Nook, it's powered by our network. If you have a TomTom Tom personal navigation device, it's powered by our network. And if you have a Vitality pill bottle, that's also powered by our network. One of these. Now, what does our network have to do with a pill bottle? This is a small entrepreneur, and this is the first product that this company made. This is their first product that they, they made. And the concept behind this pill, and we mentioned there's a great opportunity in health, is that a lot of people don't take their medication. They should take it, but they forget it, and they don't take it. So this, this, this bottle has a cap that has Wi-Fi built into it. And then there's a plug that goes on the side of the wall that connects the Wi-Fi connectivity in this pill bottle to our outside network. And so the minute you open this, this cap, there's a signal that goes to that, that goes to our network, that goes to uh, the patient's doctor that lets them know that the medication has been taken. And if they want to refill the prescription, there's a little button inside that they touch the button, and it places a, a call to refill their prescription. It used to be that I would look at a pill bottle and never see revenue. Now I do. <laughs> but it highlights that the old AT&T would have looked at this and say, do you see a billion dollar opportunity here? Ah, let's just, you know. They would have never even had an interview with our company. We took this company who's headed by a doctor, and we made it, we made it a real company. This product won the, uh, the Innovation Award at the Global uh, Wireless Association meeting in Barcelona in February of this year. This is the uh, most innovative product uh, that came out of that uh, operation, and I think it's a tribute to, uh, to the company. The next product they're working on will blow your mind, uh, which is a really, really big idea. And they've made it public, so I'm not telling you their secrets. But uh, this doctor thinks that in order to diagnose what's wrong with us in the future, you're going to use much different techniques than we do today. And he thinks you're going to have the capability in the future to walk into a doctor's office and take the entire human genome that you represent, and the doctor will be able to diagnose it. And I go, OK, so what, how is that a communication problem? I'm not. Uh, maybe Dr. Saunders, you know, but I'm, I don't know. I didn't know, but it takes an, a massive amount of information uh, to have the code of what's in your genome. And he says, 
you can't put it in DVDs. You can't. You, it's hard to transmit the data. So getting it to where you want it to go, if in the future that's the way they're going to use it. Now this is this guy's dreaming big, big time into the future. So we're working with him, figuring out how you take that information and you compress it to make it available to doctors. So it starts with a pill bottle, but then it leads to the human genome, and who knows where we're going next. But I wanted to just give you that as, as some of the things that we're doing inside of AT&T. We have pill bottles. We actually have dog collars. Uh, so if you have a pet that has a, a GPS on their collar, our network will track that pet. If you ever lose that pet, we can tell you where that pet is at. We can tell you the minute that leaves the premises of your house because it has geocoding. So it, the minute it starts running away, if it runs away, we can tell you. Uh, you can use it for teenagers. You can use it for kids. <laughs> I've had some people say you can use it on spouses, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> it, it is amazing what, uh, what the future holds. But I, I think what we're trying to do is to show you that I think uh, we've, we understand that we've got to have what you've just been talking about uh, all morning long here, more entrepreneurs, more innovation, and to take young people uh, who may not have a, a great deal of business experience and show them you know, what it takes to get a, a product to market and a product that is profitable. <laughs> so uh, let me stop my comments uh, there and see what questions uh, you may have about uh, anything I've spoken about. Yes? That's a great question. So uh, the question is, what do we do when these entrepreneurs come to us? Do we, uh, do we fund them? Uh, do, do we incubate them? Uh, it depends on the, uh, on, on the company. Uh, most often, we just help them to get their product to market, knowing what it takes to get a product tested with the right components so that it goes through our distribution channels and they can actually service it and turn it up. A lot of these devices that you see here take uh, TomTom devices, right? It's not just making the device work, but when the device is lost, when it's broken, how do you return it? Making them sure that our systems work together to, to provide the right customer service. And in some cases, we like that technology so much that we may take a percentage in the company. Uh, and so it, it goes all over the place. But most often, we just help them to bring uh, their product to market using our, our network versus our competitor's network. Yes? In terms of the criteria you look at at a prospective company you would team with, uh, do you have guidelines on technology level of readiness and maybe trailing revenue? Are you looking for a certain class size, technology and revenue wise? No, the beautiful thing about this, uh, this division is I try not to give them too many rules. Because the minute you do, you're back in a bureaucratic big AT&T. So what I gave the, the head of the division are margin targets. In other words, you can do as much business as you want, as little as you want, as big, but you've got to bring me a margin, a certain margin target. So that when we do business with these small companies, even though the revenue is small, we're making a margin. And that was the criteria, and it's worked out really, really well. Uh, for example, uh, I'll give you some, some things that we've had to do to run our business differently. Uh, the Isabella frames there, the picture frames that uh, you can download pictures digitally to, are powered by our network. But typically when we charge you for a device, we charge you per month. Right? Nobody's going to want a picture uh, frame sitting on their counter, us charging you per month. You know, that's just not a good marketing. Uh, to, but we had no other plans. So when they came into us, we said, we got to develop a new plan that we charge you by the picture. Well, we never had any plans. Our IT systems don't go by pictures. You know, so you can imagine if you were to go to the big AT&T and say, I want you to start developing an IT system for the 95 million customers we have that takes pictures into account. You would, you would be thrown out of that finance office, right? And so we figured out a way that allows them to be built essentially by the picture with an interesting creative formula that, that allows our systems to process it. And they're getting built by the picture, and our IT systems are agnostic to it, which is very cool. And that's what we wanted to do is so somebody walking in like that in the past would have just shown the door because to change anything in our IT systems infrastructure for billing, it, it's, it's very, very expensive. You guys know that, right? <laughs> so we have a few employees in the company here going, yeah, Ralph, they cost a lot. Yeah, there's a question back there. Yes.
-hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, what, what, uh, what is going to happen with a, the uh, T-Mobile merger, I, I think it's actually going to improve the quality of both companies. Because uh, first of all, one of the biggest issues we have in the industry today is the increasing bandwidth usage that devices have. And at the current trends, neither T-Mobile nor us have enough spectrum to last us for the short term until more spectrum becomes available in the country. So the first thing it will do is when we combine the spectrum holdings of both companies, we're going to have better quality spectrum. I think the quality for both companies actually are going to improve. Just to give you an idea, I mentioned this uh, at some of the meetings this morning. If you take and you compare a smartphone to a regular feature phone that just makes calls, that smartphone uses about 20x the bandwidth of a regular phone. If you have a tablet like the iPad, then it uses 100 times the bandwidth. And I, I tell people that our bandwidth and our consumption of data has grown 8,000 percent over the last four years. If you in this university will grow at 8,000 percent in the next four years, you'd have 2.2 million students here, and you'd have a hard time finding a parking spot. <laughs> And so what we have faced is this, this dilemma that the more people use these phones, the more consumption that it takes. Building an information highway is very similar to building uh, a highway for autos. So if you think about switching, a customer switching from a, a regular phone to a smartphone, it's like if you drive out of your driveway and the minute you make that change, you're not just driving your car, you're driving 20 others. And when your neighbor changes, you've got another 20. And you can imagine what happens to the highway when it gets congested. The only real way to decongest it is to get more spectrum or to build more towers or a combination of both. So that's going to get better. When, when we overlay the grids of our network and their network, we're going to have a denser grid. So we think capacity is going to improve 20 to 40 percent, depending on the area. And then finally, we've made a commitment to take the latest generation of uh, broadband technology, mobile broadband technology, to 95% of the country, which is called LTE, LTE technology, which is the best broadband technology for mobile in the world. And so I think those three things will actually offset any other aspect. And I think our, our uh, objective is to make it such that when this merger concludes, uh, T-Mobile customers are going to feel better and AT&T customers are going to feel better. And that's actually exactly what we did when we merged the old AT&T wireless with Singular uh, that I was in charge of back in uh, 2005. Both companies' networks together operated better than each one independently. Yes? Is there any truth that you want to make a commitment right now to get a response? I heard it was going for $100,000. For $100,000, my God. I'm, I'm going to have to work with Kimberly. I surely she can give me a better deal than that. You can get me in, okay. And what do I do? I get some pizzas with that, or uh, <laughs> I need a second question really fast. <laughs> okay. Javier. You know, I, uh, I told you at the beginning that I, uh, I really think that coming to FAU dramatically changed my life. And I've always uh, tried to pay it forward. You know, so what do you do? Uh, and so I've taken junior achievements. So one of the things that I do, I'm now the, the chairman for junior achievement worldwide. We are in 123 countries and reach 10 million kids every year. And we teach these kids three things. And, and the first one is entrepreneurship. Uh, the second one is financial literacy. And the third is work readiness, how to get ready to enter the workforce. And we teach them not with classroom style teachings. We teach them with experiential uh, teachings, not different than what you saw today. So we teach these kids how to run a company. The kids are taught how to take different roles and run a company. I I'll tell you one of the most impactful things that I've seen our, our organization do is our chief executive officer just came back uh, from Nairobi. And uh, if, if you know that area, there's some slums in Nairobi called the Kibera slums. It's probably some of the worst slums on the planet. The living conditions are desperate. 
there's no jobs. The kids just don't have any place to get a job. So we went there thinking that we would teach them some of the financial literacy basics and discovered if we taught them, they could not use them because there would be no jobs. But we taught them to form a little company. And what these kids did, one kid, he went into the garbage dumps, got Clorox bottles, old Clorox bottles, out of the garbage dumps, and made wristbands, like the Livestrong wristbands, and then covered those wristbands with the colors of the World Cup teams that were playing in South Africa for the World Cup, and sold them. That kid now has hired 35 other kids and is running his own little company out of the slums of Nairobi. It's, it's amazing. The world is full of that. If you uh, look at the same example in Yemen, you know, Yemen was the country that uh, this, um, this guy that who tried to hijack a plane, if you remember, uh, the young, young boy. But the story about Yemen is the women in Yemen and the way that they're treated because of the culture there. We, we went into Yemen and taught those women how to do the same thing, how to set up their own little business with small microloans. And we had a room full of women in Yemen that were coming in learning how to be an entrepreneur that had tremendous impact, I think. If you can prevent some of these kids from going the wrong way and having a good place to work or having the, the free enterprise system, I think we could dramatically change the outlook. Because some of these kids that are doing these things don't have any hope. I mean, if you get on an airplane hoping to blow it up, you clearly don't have any hope. You've, you've reached the end, and I think what we're doing is hoping to make things for the better. So I, I've seen what it changed and made in me just to have hope that, that you could reach your dreams, and that's what we try to do in, in places with uh, JA, and same thing with the Boy Scouts. What other thoughts or questions do you have? I, I just wanted to uh, just thank, uh, thank you, President Saunders, for inviting me back. This is uh, great to come home. Uh, I, uh, I had uh, uh, Rick uh, show me some of the barracks. I, we could call them barracks. We call them the T-buildings, right? The T-buildings. Uh, I think we're uh, Dr. Stevens. I, I actually got uh, my engineering training in the barracks. and. Uh, I didn't realize that we were green then, but uh, I guess with the green barracks, we're pretty green then. But I've always been fond of, uh, of looking back, and it was good to come, to come home in a way, and to uh, not only come home, but to see the great institution that FAU has become. So uh, thanks again for inviting me back. It's been an honor. Thank you.